is the final chapter of Where Do You Get That Amulet? Chapter 13, Prof Gamal Makes a Wish. The next morning, Sam's mother set off to collect Mr. Noel from the hospital. She left Jane sitting in the kitchen, rather moodily sipping a cup of instant coffee while Sam made pancakes. Jane was going home in three days and was feeling a bit depressed and flat. She felt very guilty because how could she be feeling depressed when her dear uncle had almost died and then been miraculously cured? She should be like Sam and her aunt, very happy and grateful. I've made loads, Sam said proudly, flipping a pancake over in a professional manner. Go and call Maylie and Peter to come over and have some. We've got the kitchen to our souls for a change and I found the chocolate spread. Let's have a feast. Okay, Jane said. I'll take Phoebe. Come, Phoebs. And she went across the field to call Peter and Maylie. Their father was already out on the farm and their mother was just about to leave for the office. Breakfast? But Robin just gave you supper, she said surprised. Oh well, off you go then. I'll be back at lunch and we'll go to the library after, okay? All right, Peter said, getting up very pleased at the idea of pancakes. He yelled in the direction of the bathroom. Come on, Maylie, Sam's made us pancakes and they're getting cold. As they approached the farmhouse, they saw with dismay a posh two-seater sports car parked in the yard. I know, who can that be? Peter said, wrinkling his nose. Their lovely adult-free pancake breakfast was being interrupted. The children knew the cars of the usual visitors, neighbours and farm supplies, and this one was unfamiliar and clearly not built for farm roads. Glancing at the number plate, Peter saw that it came from Cape Town. The front door was wide open and the three entered and made their way towards the kitchen from whence drifted a delicious smell. Phoebe ran ahead, then barked. Clearly the visitor or visitors was not someone she knew. As they reached the kitchen door, they received a horrible shock. Sam was standing by the stove, spatula in hand, and in front of him was a large man who, they took a few seconds to realise, was none other than Professor Gamal. A look of enormous relief crossed Sam's face when he saw them enter. Prof Gamal turned round at the sound of their footsteps, looking anxious, and then smiled. Good morning. I wasn't expecting to meet all of you again. How nice! His smile, Jane thought, was like the smile of a crocodile. All teeth and no humour. Good morning, they muttered, casting horrified looks at Sam, which said, What on earth is he doing here? You must be wondering what I'm doing here, Mr Gamal said pleasantly. I was just about to explain to your friend here, and he waved his hand towards Sam, who was looking at them like a deer caught in headlights. Uh, yes, Peter said, realising that they should act like seeing him was a complete surprise and totally unexpected. Well, the professor said, giving Phoebe, he was sniffing his trousers in a suspicious way, a hard push with his foot. Well, I believe we have a common interest. Uh, a common interest, Peter repeated, giving Sam a look which spoke volumes. Yes, I believe we're all interested in the same ancient Egyptian amulet. I believe you referred to it as the magic stone when we met in the museum. Uh, we don't have a magic stone, Peter said weakly, cursing his hesitation and the uncertainty in his voice and thinking he should have said, what magic stone? No, the professor said politely, but his eyes were glittering in a way that made the children afraid. That is strange. I could have sworn you said you had a magic stone. And he smiled his nasty smile again and moved so that he stood between them and the kitchen door. You must be wondering how I found you, he added. The children stared at him. No one spoke. Well, that's the advantage of a small town. Everyone knows everyone. His eyes ran over them in a calculating way as he spoke. Oh, silly me, I almost forgot. I've got something to show you. The children exchanged horrified looks. What was he going to do? Prof Gamal put his hand into his jacket park pocket and pulled out a piece of paper, unfolded it and placed it on the kitchen table. I believe this came from you, Mrs Melotto. And he turned and looked at Jane. There was a dead silence in the kitchen as the children stared down at their printed email. No one could think of a thing to say in response. The professor reached into another inside pocket and slowly, casually pulled out a gun. 
He pointed it at the children and then loaded it, saying in a calm but chilling voice, I want the amulet. I know you have it. Give it to me or I'm going to shoot the dog. And he pointed the gun at Fleeby, who was lying under the table, glaring up at him, her doggy senses telling her he was bad news. As he spoke, Sam's hand flew up and clutched the magic stone, which still lay in his top pocket. He'd been planning to put it back after breakfast with everyone in attendance, have some kind of thank you ceremony while they did so. Professor Gamal did not miss the involuntary movement. He pointed the gum at Sam and said, Put it on the table now. And as he spoke, he flicked off the safety catch on the gun. Sam stood frozen with indecision and the professor suddenly shouted, Now! Or I shoot the dog! And they all jumped. The professor loaded his gun and took aim at Phoebe. They could see he was deadly serious. All right, all right, I will, Sam said hastily and unbuttoned his pocket and placed the stone on the table as far away from the professor and as close to himself as possible. The professor's eyes bulged and he stared at it without blinking as if it had hypnotised him. The children stood dead still, watching his face and his gun, which was still pointing at Phoebe. An expression which looked strangely like fear crossed his face. What does it do? he asked hoarsely. No one answered. What does it do? he screamed, moving the gun up so that it pointed at them again. You can travel back in time with it, Sam said. Where did you find it? On a hill on the farm. On a hill on the farm? Prof Gamal sounded disbelieving and his face went an alarming red. He clearly thought they were lying. He's telling the truth, Peter said. He found it on the hill and we made a wish about going back in time to see what a fossil we found looked like and it took us back to when it really was alive, millions of years ago. Sam was thinking fast. The only way out was if they could trick the professor in some way. It only works if I make the wish, she said. Only I can make the wish to time travel, or it doesn't work. Prof Gamal sneered. Do you think I'm a fool, boy? And he snatched up the stone, putting his gun in his pocket as he did so. I wish to go to Saqqara in the year 3100 before Christ, he cried. The children stared at him, waiting for him to vanish, but nothing happened. The professor held the stone up above his head and cried again. I wish to go to Saqqara in the year 3100 BC. But he remained in the kitchen, holding the stone and looking rather foolish. He lowered his arm and grabbed Sam roughly with the other. Make the wish, boy! And he thrust the stone at Sam with his free hand. Sam felt like he had no choice but to obey. His mind was spinning wildly, trying to work out what she should do, but all he could think was that he would have to time travel with the professor and then tried to escape back without him. Say it, hissed the professor into Sam's ear, holding his arm so hard that it bruised. I, I wish to go to Saqqara in the, in the year, in the year, he paused. In 3100 BC, the professor said. In 3100 BC, Sam said. The others watched in horror, expecting Sam and the professor to disappear. In the silence which followed Sam's words came the sound of wheels crunching on the gravel outside. Through the one window they could see the two paleontological land rovers pulling up. Indescribable relief washed over the children. Peter moved first, secure in the knowledge that backup was coming. He took two steps towards the professor who was still blocking the door and said, Ha ha, fooled you. It's not really a magic stone. The professor stared at him in a confused way as several car doors slammed outside. We were just joking, Peter said, trying to sound like someone who had played a silly light-hearted prank. The professor abruptly released his iron grip on Sam's arm and, not looking back, stalked out of the kitchen, through the lounge and out past the surprised students who were walking up the stairs. Hello? Hello? called Dr. Mukuna, knocking on the pane of the open door politely. The children, who'd been standing frozen in the kitchen, staring after Prof Gamal, shook themselves and ran out. As they greeted Dr. Makuna and the team, they saw the sports car pull off in a flurry of flying stones and squealing wheels. Prof Gamal clearly had no wish to deal with the newcomers. Who was that? Dr. Makuna asked, staring after it. Prof Gamal had almost knocked him over as he'd stormed out and had not looked at or greeted him at all. Very hard. Uh, no one, just someone who wanted to see my dad, Sam said. 
He was a horrible man. He wanted to, said Maylie, and would have said more, but Jane grabbed her hand and yanked her away, saying, Come, Maylie, let's go get some cups out for tea and put the kettle on. And as soon as she got her out of earshot, Hester to her say nothing, absolutely nothing about the visit to anyone. It transpired that Dr. McCunn and the team had heard about Mr. Knoll's heart attack and miraculous recovery from a neighbouring farmer and had come by on their way back to their accommodation to inquire how he was doing. Sam told them that his mother was on her way to fetch him from the hospital and invited them in for tea and pancakes. He wanted to keep them there. Their presence was insurance against Prof. Gamal returning. At first, Dr. McCunna demurred, saying there were too many of them and they didn't want to take advantage after the all they'd gone through with his father. But the children seemed so very keen that in the end he agreed, saying that they would stay out on the porch so as not to dirty the house with their dusty clothes and boots. Actually, I have something I particularly wanted to talk to you all about, Dr. McCunna said. Jane and Peter made tea and coffee. Sam handed out pancakes. Sadly, now there was only a quarter each because the party had grown so. But the students retrieved a big box of biscuits from the Land Rover and soon they were all sipping and laughing. It all felt very jolly and ordinary and the horrors of Prof. Gamal's visit began to seem rather surreal, like a very bad dream. Now, what I wanted to talk to you about, Dr. McCunna said with a smile, is we've decided to let you name the fossil you found. You will have to follow the conventions and give it a name based on Latin or Greek words or name it after a place or person. But what you choose is up to you. He explained that plants and animals all have two scientific names, almost like a first name and a surname. Living things are given names to identify them and to tell us what other plants or animals they are related to. Those that are closely related share a family name, like us humans. Scientists use what's called the Linnaean system of classification, and all living things are classified according to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I told my students to remember the sentence, King Phil came over for great salad. So K for kingdom, P for phylum, C for class, you get it? So now your fossil belongs to the family Thrinaxodontidae, and you can choose a new genus and species name to indicate that your fossil is different from all the other Thrinaxodon fossils that have been found so far. You've discovered an entirely new genus and species, which is very exciting. As the students were helping clear up the tea things, Mrs. Nell arrived back from the hospital with Mr. Nell. He'd been packed and waiting on the hospital steps, desperately keen to get away and back home to his beloved farm and family. In the fuss of the greetings and Mr. McCunna's effusive apologies for being there at such a time as his homecoming, Sam picked up the stone which had been lying forgotten on the kitchen table and ran down to the pond. He quickly slipped it back in its hiding place under the mud and stones, whispering to it, I'm sorry, but you'll be safe here and thank you, thank you for my father. After much discussion, and some quite heated argument, the children decided to name the fossil Eridum Magilithos in honour of the magic amulet. They came up with the name after much googling and looking up of Greek and Latin words. Lithos was the Greek word for stone, and magi meant magician or learned priest and was a recognition of the healing powers of the stone. The new genus name Eridum was Latin for dry land and referred to the fact that it was found in the semi-desert Karoo, but also that it had been in the Sahara Desert in the times of ancient Egypt. Dr. Makuna was terribly impressed with the name. He thought the magic stone they referred to was the fossil whose bones had absorbed minerals from the surrounding earth to become rock hard. They did not dispel this idea. They were more anxious than ever to keep the amulet a secret from everyone, What a near disaster their incautious discussion in the museum had caused. For the two days following Prof. Gobal's visit, they were very nervous of being left without the protective presence of a grown-up and stayed together in the vicinity of their parents or the farm workers or Mr. September the gardener who glared at them and grumbled under his breath. He knew those young uns were up to some mischief. He could clearly see they'd been messing around in his pond. His fierceness did not put them off, however, if anything, it made them feel safer. 
Prof Gamal had been extremely lucky to find them all alone and unprotected that morning. They discussed his visit endlessly, trying to come to terms with what had happened. On Jane's very last day, they held a conference to try and decide what to do next. Maybe we don't need to do anything different, Jane said. You were so clever to tell him that we were playing a trick on him, she added admiringly to Peter. They were sitting in Sam's bedroom, staring at the stone which lay in the middle of his bed. But did he believe me, Peter said. I don't know if he did, even though the wishes didn't work. Imagine what he'd do if it knew it, he knew it cured people of illness, Sam said worriedly. He could force the families of sick people to pay millions to cure them. There was a silence while the others considered how awful it would be if the stone fell into hands such as Prof Gamal's. After what's happened, I almost feel like we should put the stone somewhere where no one can find it. Not even us, Sam said. It's our responsibility, and it's in danger if Prof Gamal hasn't given up. Even if it be, he believes it has no magic powers, he may want it just because it is the amulet of Temenot. You're right, Peter said. We definitely need to keep it totally safe. I think we need to behave as if Prof Gamal is going to try and get the stone again. We mustn't have it on us. It must stay hidden. Not gone anymore. Time travels, Jane said, looking devastated. Well, definitely not for a long time, Sam replied. And why didn't the stone grant the wish when Sam made it? Or for that matter, when Prof Gamal made it, Sam continued. I know Sam usually does the wishes, but we know it works for other people because it worked for many. I've been thinking about that, and I think it's because when I wished for Prof Gamal, I didn't want to go. It wasn't really my wish. Or maybe it's using my mag it's magic up healing my father. We just don't know, Sam said irritably because he was feeling very stressed. It's impossible to know. Oh my, look over there, Jane exclaimed. They looked to where she was pointing and saw Mrs. Nell riding a camel, Dan by the looks of things. She'd made a kind of blanket saddle on which she perched rather uncomfortably and she held the reins of the new halter which had just arrived that morning in her hands. Jane clapped her hands in glee. That looks such fun. Come on, let's go ask if we can have a turn. I'm just going to do something quickly then I'll join you, Sam said. You guys carry on with the camels. I won't be long. Sure you don't need any help? Peter asked, knowing what Sam was planning. No thanks, I'll be fine, Sam said, folding his hand around the stone in the pocket. He walked down to the pond and had a quick check around. No one in sight. He waded in and bent down to dig a hole in the mud under the big stone in the middle and then stood up to take the stone from his pocket. I wish I knew if the magic was over, he said to himself as he bent to lay the stone in its muddy bed. For a second, just as the stone sunk down into the water, Sam thought he saw it glow in his hand. It might have been a ray of light striking the shining rings of the water, but then again, it might not. Feeling very happy all of a sudden, he climbed out of the pond and headed back towards the camels and his friends. That was the final episode of Where'd You Get That Amulet? Please show your support for this podcast by rating and following it and recommending it to all your friends. Please leave a comment and let us know what you would like to hear about in book three. Take care until then. Thank you.